So in today's video, we're going to talk about bioterrorism agents. Now, apparently, test writers have gotten really cute, and they think that they're going to ask you questions about bioterrorism, because apparently when you go to medical school, you're signing up to work for the CDC. Well, not quite. But the problem here is that all of the different review books on the market and all of the different board review companies on the internet don't cover this topic. So after a hundred, if not thousands of requests from the dirty USMLE subscribers, I've decided that it's time to get you free points if they ask you a bioterrorism question. So this lecture is going to teach you everything that you need to know about bioterrorism agents. And I want to say from the start that we're not going to review bioterrorism agents that are already found in other books. We're going to cover the ones that are not in review sources. So with that said, let's get started. A bioterrorism agent is any agent that's intended to produce death or disease in humans. So oftentimes, this is when a government will take an agent, which could be a bacteria, a virus, a toxin, and they'll weaponize it. They'll try to produce it in mass quantity to potentially be used in warfare. This is really terroristic and it's terrible. And because of this, the United States Center for Disease Control, the CDC, has come up with guidelines and treatment algorithms and um, basically a whole slew of information to counter any type of bioterrorism threat that would be had against the country. So let's get started and talk about how these are classified. So there are three categories of bioterrorism agents. We categorize them into category A, category B, and category C. Basically, the closer you are to the front of the alphabet, the more dangerous you are. So A is super dangerous, B is you know, pretty dangerous, and C is not quite as dangerous, but all of these have potential to be weaponized and cause disease and death, and this is how they are categorized. So we're going to break these down into three categories, go through the categories one at a time. So obviously we're going to start with category A. Now before I get into the new agents that you've never heard of before, let's quickly review the agents in category A that you should already be familiar with. So the first one is anthrax. Bacillus anthracis. And here's just a quick summary of things you should already know. It's a gram-positive rod, a spore-forming, exotoxin-forming agent. It has that poly-D capsule that helps with its virulence. It allows for edema and lethal factor entry into the cell to cause hemorrhagic mediastinitis or a cutaneous black eschar. Also, you can have GI manifestations. But here are some pictures that you should be familiar with that should cue you into anthrax. Remember that black eschar the widened mediastinum because of mediastinitis, and then the appearance of the medusa head under the low-powered microscope. And I've showed you, put a little picture of medusa's head right next to that image so you can see kind of how that serpentine-like appearance is actually a buzzword. Medusa head is anthrax. So that's Bacillus anthracis, our first category A agent. Again, this is just a rapid review because this is in other review textbooks. Some other agents that you should already know that are in other review textbooks that I'm quickly going to go through rapidly. Um, botulism, Yersinia pestis, aka the bubonic plague, and then Francisella tularensis. So for botulism, obviously this is an anaerobic gram positive rod. It's exotoxin producing. Remember that children get it from spores, but adults get it through the exotoxin. It cleaves snare proteins and prevents acetylcholine release, which causes a flaccid paralysis, and we have an antitoxin to treat it. Yersinia pestis, aka the bubonic plague, it causes buboes. Um, it is a gram-negative oxidase-negative agent with no H2S production. It is exotoxin-forming and coagulase-positive. Buboes, uh, you can sort of see in that picture, but any, any picture that looks like that, you want to think of the bubonic plague. Francisella tularensis, really quickly, is an anaerobic gram-negative cacobacilli. It causes a few different types of tularemia. The most popular or prominent, I should say, is ulceroglandular, which causes conjunctivitis, headache, and pharyngitis. You can get a typhoid type tularemia, which just pretty much causes nausea and vomiting, or a pulmonary tularemia, which causes a flu-like illness. So again, I'm rapidly going through these because these agents are in things like first aid and other textbooks. These are category A agents that can be weaponized as bioterrorism agents. Now that you understand them and you already have a familiarity with them, if not, please go review them. Let's talk about the five agents that you've probably never heard of before, and that's really going to be the focus of this Category A section. So those are Marburg virus, Machupo virus, Variola major, aka smallpox, Ebola, which you may or may not have heard of, 
and Lassa virus. So how do we remember that these are the category A agents? Well, we've got to come up with a mnemonic, and my mnemonic is many, many viruses exist lethally. So M-M-V-E-L, many, many viruses exist lethally. That's our category A mnemonic. So because it exists lethally, category A is the most lethal category, which is how I remember that the mnemonic with the word lethally is category A. So let's get right into it. We'll start with Marburg virus. So Marburg virus is a filovirus. It's named for the German city that it was originally discovered in, which is Marburg. It is a linear, non-segmented, single-stranded RNA virus, and there's a picture of it right there. As far as virulence and transmission, it uses a neiman pick cholesterol transporter to mediate entry into the cell, and it is spread with contact of bodily fluids. Historically, this was spread from uh, actually contact with primates, and the host is thought to be the Egyptian fruit bat. So Marburg virus has an incubation period of five to 10 days. And after that incubation period, it ca causes a protracted hemorrhagic fever with pancreatitis, a maculopapular rash, and just general symptoms that are consistent with a flu-like illness. Unfortunately, treatment here is just going to be supportive. So if somebody contracts Marburg virus, there is a very high rate of death because we don't have anything to treat it with. Um, I want to pause for one second and say that these Category A agents all have something in common, and that is that they all cause hemorrhagic illness. So hemorrhagic fever, where you have this systemic illness categorized by shock and bleeding from mucosal sites, that is very characteristic of these category A agents. So by starting with Marburg, this is a hemorrhagic illness that can cause generalized systemic symptoms such as shock. But the one specific symptom here I would say is that pancreatitis from Marburg virus. So if you want to think about a way to remember that, Marburg was discovered in Germany and the Germans are known for their beer. And if you drink too much beer, you can get pancreatitis. So that's how I remember Marburg virus. So that's our first category A agent. Not too bad. Hopefully that, I mean, that wasn't too tough for you. I understand that this is probably new for a lot of people, but the way to learn this is just to constantly revisit and memorize this and use a couple stupid mnemonics like Marburg, Germany, beer, pancreatitis. Let's talk about the next M, Machupo virus. So Machupo virus is a Mamarina virus, which I had never heard of prior to studying these, uh, aka it's an arena virus. Uh, this is also known as black typhus or Bolivian hemorrhagic fever. Of course, this has some ties to Bolivia, hence the name Bolivian hemorrhagic fever. And just like Marburg virus, as I told you, this causes a hemorrhagic fever. Now Machupo virus its vector is the large Vesper mouse, which I've put a picture on the slide to hopefully help you remember this. It's a large Vesper mouse, and this is spread from bodily fluid contact. So if a human gets this from, uh, gets infected with this, it's spread through bodily fluids. And the original vector is the large Vesper mouse in terms of transmitting this disease or this virus. Now, Machupo virus, of course, causes hemorrhagic fever because we're talking about our category A agents. Specifically for Machupo, you get these petechiae and massive oral bleeds. So things like mucosal bleeding, if you look at the eyes, I mean, you, you can't miss this on an exam. The way that I remember this is Machupo sounds like a drug lord uh, in South America. So I always think of a drug lord just like punching somebody in the face and causing their eyes and their mouth to bleed. Uh, when they're trying to shake you down for some drug deal. So Machupo virus, I think of Machupo, the drug lord, punching somebody in the face and causing oral bleeding and conjunctival bleeding, hemorrhagic fever. That is Machup Machupo virus. So Marburg, the Germans like beer, you can get pancreatitis. Machupo, you get punched in the face by the drug lord Machupo and you bleed from your oral places like your gums and your uh, conjunctivae. Uh, again, both of these will cause hemorrhagic fever, so there's really no way to differentiate based on that. Moving on, we're going to talk about smallpox, so variola major smallpox. Now, smallpox is not a name that should be too unfamiliar to you, but unfortunately, they don't really teach it too much in medical school, so let's kind of dissect this and go through it. So, smallpox is caused by the variola virus, and this is a pox virus. It's a brick-shaped, double-stranded DNA virus, and I've put a couple pictures of it on the slide to hopefully uh, help you encode that in your memory. So I don't know if I would call that brick shaped, but that's the characteristic appearance of smallpox. So if you see that, the answer is smallpox. Now, as far as virulence goes, this is a thick, um, this virus has a thick, thick viral envelope, and that helps it um, with its virulence factors. Now, specifically, 
it has Golgi membranes with polypeptides and modified hemagglutinin. And those are just some buzzwords as far as how this virus can actually incorporate into the host cell. Um, the perhaps highest yield thing to know about smallpox is its symptoms and the progression of the symptoms. So how this works is there's a, nine, a seven to 19 day incubation period. Now the first way that this starts is with sores in the mouth and these sores progress over the course of those 19 or 20, 20 or so days. And I've put a picture of the progression of these sores on the slide so you can see how they move in time. So they start as really small, almost vesic vesicular looking sores and they progress, they get larger and eventually they will erupt into a pharyngeal rash. So oftentimes they're in the mouth, they're in the oral cavity. And as they progress through time, they, they erupt into a pharyngeal rash. So they'll move from this vesicular kind of lesion into a full-blown pharyngeal vesicular, 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 excuse me, pustular rash in the pharynx. Now, after the pharyngeal rash, it turns into a full body rash. So you get these massive growth of pustules all over the body. And you can see that on the picture in the right. And what happens over time is that those pustules will lead to scarring and fibrosis and they'll take on this hardened appearance. So initially they, they look very pustular, right? They look like they have a little bit of fluid, maybe a, um, a central denting in them, but over time they scar and become very, very fibrotic. Now, the important thing to note is that these sores, as they progress, have something in them called guarnieri bodies, or guarnieri inclusion bodies. If you see that buzzword, the answer is smallpox. Just like of negri bodies and other types of bodies or inclusion bodies that you hear of in other types of pathogens, guarnieri inclusion bodies are specific to smallpox. So again, if I were going to summarize here, I would say that there is a 20-day period over which you have the growth of initially small vesicular lesions in the mouth that go back into the pharynx. They form larger pustules, which then go onto the full body on the external part of the skin. They lead to big pustule formation that eventually scars over time. So that is variola major, aka smallpox. We've got two more agents in the category A section. The next one is Ebola. So Ebola has obviously made a lot of headlines in the past couple of years because of the Ebola crisis in Africa. Now Ebola is an enveloped, linear, non-segmented, negative sense, single-stranded RNA virus. Whew, that's a mouthful. It is a filovirus with a helical capsule and there is a picture of Ebola. If you see that picture on your exam, the answer is Ebola. Now Ebola targets endothelial cells and it is transmitted, we think, through contact with bats, pigs, or primates that carry the virus. Now the symptoms of the treatment, it's really just hemorrhagic fever here that quickly progresses to shock and multi-organ failure and it's very lethal. It's absolutely lethal, hence the crisis and the quick transmission. Hemorrhagic fever, again, is our sort of consistent theme here in category A. So Ebola just causes that hemorrhagic fever with shock and multi-organ failure. Definitely need to know it, but it's sort of non-specific here. So not too much to memorize about Ebola, maybe other than its viral makeup. That is all you really need to know about Ebola. The final category A agent is Lassa virus, L-A-S-S-A, -S -S -A, Lassa. So many, many viruses exist lethally. The L in lethally is for Lassa virus. So Lassa virus is an enveloped, single-stranded, bisegmented ambusense RNA virus. And it specifically is an arena virus. There's a small picture of it. You don't need to know what that picture looks like. It's pretty nonspecific, but I've included it there just to make this slide a little sexier. Now, Lassa virus has a really interesting virulence and transmission, and I think this is probably worth knowing. So it has glycoproteins and zinc binding proteins. Now the glycoproteins bind to something called alpha dystroglycan on the whole cell and allow the virus to attach to the cell and get the viral contents into the host. The zinc binding protein is what regulates the viral transcription. So I would probably know those two features because those could be tested. They're a little bit higher yield than some of the other information in this category A section. Now, Lassa virus will obviously cause hemorrhagic fever because, again, we're talking about a Category A bioterrorism agent. But the specific symptom to Lassa virus is deafness. And the way that I remember this is I think of somebody lassoing, for Lassa, somebody's ear. You lasso up the ear so that the person can't hear and you cause deafness. So that's Lassa virus. Don't forget, lassoing up the ear. That's my stupid mnemonic. But that's it. That's all of the Category A agents. The five that you probably have never heard of are many, many viruses exist lethally. Marburg, Machupo, Variola, Ebola, and Lassa. So those are your Category A agents. You now know them all.
So now let's talk about category B, because remember on this slide, we said there are three different categories. Category A are the ones that are very, very lethal. And category B are the intermediate agents that are still pretty lethal, but not quite as lethal as category A. So just like with category A, the category B agents have some that you already know, and those are shown here. So you already should know about brucellosis, Clostridium perfringes, Salmonella, Shigella, and the specific O157H7 E. coli. So those are sort of like your really bad food poisoning agents. Things that you can get from contaminated water, such as Vibrio or Crypto. And then your viral encephalitides. You already should know this stuff. This is in first aid. This is in other review sources. So I'm not going to talk about these. I'm going to talk about the three that you've probably never heard of before. And those are Bulcorderia mali, Ricinus communis, and Bulcorderia pseudo mali. And these are really difficult to say. So, you know, pronoun pronounce these how you want to, but that's how I say them. So, what is the mnemonic for category B? Well, pretty easy. Category B, BRB. Be right back. BRB for category B. Bulcorderia mali, Bulcorderia pseudo mali, basically the same thing with pseudo in front, and then Ricinus communis. So, BRB. This is going to be a little bit easier to memorize and, and to account for mentally. So let's start with Bulcarduria mali. So Bulcarduria mali is also known as glanders. So Bulcarduria mali is a gram-negative bipolar aerobic coccobacillus. It's non-modal, and there's a little cute picture of it. You don't need to know what that picture looks like, but again, just to spice up the slide a little bit. As far as virulence goes, Bulcarduria mali uses a type 4 secretion system, and that's really high yield, so don't forget what that means. A type 4 secretion system, basically it has its own injection system to inject virulent contents into whatever cell it's targeting. So the way that this works is it lyses an entry vacuole, and then it causes the growth of multinucleated giant cells, which help propagate the infection. Now, the original host of Bulcarduria mali is horses. So you know, if you've taken any practice questions, you know that test writers love to ask you about hosts and vectors. So know that uh, horses are the host for Bulcarduria mali. Symptoms and treatment. So this causes glanders. I told you that it's also known as glanders. And what is glanders? So glanders has a couple uh, unique features to it. The first is that it can be pulmonary glanders. So, so generally speaking, glanders is the formation of abscesses in certain certain cavities or certain tissues. So pulmonary glanders is pulmonary abscesses. Abscesses can technically form anywhere, it just has a propensity to form in the lungs. You also get certain things like nasal discharge. And if you go on Google and you, you type in the word glanders, you'll probably see a lot of pictures of horses with like this really disgusting looking uh, infectious discharge coming out of their nose because since the host is horses, it, it disproportionately affects horses, but in humans, humans also get a really nasty nasal discharge with abscess formation along the respiratory tract. So that is sort of how glanders manifest in humans. Now treatment is going to be supportive. We don't have anything to treat this, but Bulcorduria mali causes glanders, specifically abscess formations in the lungs with some nasty nasal discharge. Don't forget the type 4 secretion system. The way that I remember this is that uh, nasal discharge coming from your upper respiratory tract is a secretion, so hence type 4 secretion system for Bulcorduria mali. So that is our first agent in category B. Now, because Bulcordoria mali and Bulcordoria pseudo mali are very, very similar sounding, I'm going to skip the R for now and go right into pseudo mali. So let's talk about that. Now, this is not known as glanders. That's an error on the slide. This is actually known as Whitmore's disease. So Bulcordoria pseudo mali, aka Whitmore's disease, this is a gram negative bipolar aerobic modal rod shaped agent that has a safety pin appearance. So that's a lot of descriptive. Uh, characteristics. The reason that I put them on the slide is because oftentimes uh, exam writers love to ask you these stupid details, so I do think that they're unfortunately worth knowing, so try to memorize that. But this is what it looks like. It's a grab negative bipolar aerobic modal rod-shaped safety pin appearing agent. And if you say that 10 times, maybe you'll finally memorize it. Now, this is known as Whitmore's disease. And how this works is that the virulence is really because of a super strong flagella uh, at the back of this pathogen. So it can propulse itself very strongly and cause infection. Now, infection in humans is because of contact with dust, soil, or droplets. Now, 
the people that are most at risk of contracting Whitmore's disease or Bulcordoria pseudomaly are those with diabetes. So someone who's already immunocompromised. Now, this can manifest acutely or chronically. Now, acutely, it's going to look like a pneumonia. It's going to look very, very similar to pneumonia. But chronically, it's going to look more like tuberculosis. So keep those things in mind. It's going to disproportionately affect the lungs, kind of like how Bulcordoria mali caused lung abscesses. This causes acutely a pneumonia. Chronically, a picture more consistent with tuberculosis. But keep that in mind and remember that this affects disproportionately those who are immunocompromised, such as diabetics. Now, the treatment here is going to be IV ceftazidime or meropenem. There is oral agents. However, if they give this to you on your exam, it's probably going to be in the setting of somebody who's really, really sick since this is a bioterrorism agent. So I really only think it's worth memorizing the IV treatment, which is ceftazidime or meropenem. So that is Bulcordoria pseudomaly. So now we've talked about both Bulcordorias. And if I were going to quickly summarize, I would say that they affect the lungs. Remember, mali or glanders causes pulmonary abscesses and a little bit of nasty discharge. Pseudomaly is going to look like a pneumonia acutely or a tuberculosis chronically and affect those who are already immunocompromised. The last category B agent that we need to quickly talk about is Racinus communis. Now, Racinus communis is actually a toxin, and this is found in the castor bean mash. So all over the world, um, castor beans are used to produce oils. And when the castor beans get mashed up, there's a resin that's found in them which is this toxin. So it's sort of a byproduct of how we mash up these beans to produce oils. And the toxin itself is what is really toxic and be, can be used as a bioterroristic agent. So the castor oil plant is shown there on the left and the castor beans are shown there on the right on this slide. And when you mash up the beans, one of the byproducts in this reaction that sort of sits there once you take the oil out is this racinus toxin. Now racinus toxin prevents protein translation. So if it's injected or ingested or inhaled, it prevents protein translation, which can obviously be quite deadly in a human that relies on translation in order to form end products. The symptoms here, uh, it, it's going to cause pulmonary edema, which will lead to heart failure. So that's primarily how this manifests. But the other uh, way that this could come about is if this is actually ingested it could look a little bit like a food poisoning, which could quickly progress into hypovolemic shock because of the degree of nausea and vomiting and diarrhea that ensues. So treatment here is just supportive, uh, but that is racinus toxin coming from the plant, the castor oil plant. Um, this is a pretty toxic substance and it doesn't get a lot of sexy headlines because it comes from a plant, but it is definitely a bioterrorism agent. So I would know this one. But that's all of our Category B agents. Remember, Category B, BRB, Bulcordoria mali, Racinus communis, and Bulcordoria pseudomaly. Those are your Category B agents. So, of course, we're going to wrap up now and talk about Category C. And luckily, there are already a lot that you know in Category C, which I'm not going to talk about. Those are tuberculosis, SARS, yellow fever, influenza, and hantavirus. So you should already be familiar with these if you've studied your microbiology. If not, get right to it. But because you already know this, there are really only two Category C agents that you've probably never heard about before, and that's what I'm going to focus on today. So those two Category C agents that you've probably never heard about are the Nipah virus and chikungunya. Chikungunya, that's a tough one to say, but fun to say once you get it down. So what is our mnemonic for remembering Nipah virus and chikungunya for Category C? Well, we've done A, We've done B, and now we're on C. Now, category C. So N in now, and C in C for Nipah and Chikungunya. Chikungunya. So let's start by talking about the Nipah virus. So the Nipah virus is an RNA paramyx virus. This was actually identified. So after the uh, Ebola crisis happened in the in, within the past two years, uh, a task force came up with a list of viruses that could be possible. Uh, future epidemics. And Nipah virus was identified as, as a potentially really dangerous virus that we don't know too much about that could be really, really bad if it starts to spread. So that was included in this category C uh, list that was uh, designed by this task force. So Nipah virus, RNA paramyxovirus, looks like that little picture there. And how this works is the host is actually fruit bats. Um, and it's transmitted to humans and pigs who come in contact with the fruit bats or in humans who consume raw date palm sap. So in, uh, in Africa, there are these trees, the raw date palms, and sap comes off the trees. And, and you see in this picture on the right on this slide, a lot of cultures will put these bottles up there and collect the date palm sap. Now, 
as they collect it, if they eat raw date palm sap, it could contain Nipah virus. And we're not quite sure if that's because fruit bats have gotten to it first and infected it with the virus, but consuming raw date palm sap or coming in contact with fruit bats is how Nipah virus is transmitted. So I would know both of those buzzwords. So fruit bats and raw date palm sap can, can uh, transmit Nipah virus. So Nipah virus causes an encephalitis that can progress to psychosis and seizure and treatment is going to be supportive. The way that I remember Nipah virus is I think of a kippah, which, like a Jewish kippah, which goes on your head. And because it's on the head, that reminds me of encephalitis, seizure, and psychosis. These are all things that manifest because of the brain. So Nipah, the Nipah kippah, the Jewish kippah, on your head, causing encephalitis, psychosis, or seizures. Treatment's just going to be supportive here. So I think that was pretty easy. A lot of buzzwords to know there, but not too bad to memorize. Our last agent for the entire lecture today, until you'll know all the bio bioterrorism agents, is chikungunya. So chikungunya, uh, funny, funny name. This is an RNA toga virus. It's positive sense and single-stranded. Not too much that you need to know here. Basically, this is um, transmitted from a bite from the 80s mosquito biting humans. It replicates in fibroblasts and endothelial cells and hence spreads the pathogen that way. Symptoms here, it really just causes a fever and an arthralgia. Fever and an arthralgia are your two major symptoms here. And that arthralgia that or arthritis, if you will, will last for a very, very long time. So constant joint pain, really achy and annoying. Um, this can be weaponized to cause really bad arthritis. I know it sounds silly, but it's, it's really quite serious. We don't have a vaccine. Treatment is just supportive. The mnemonic for remembering chikungunya is that it sounds like chicken. And when you eat chicken wings or chicken legs, you're eating chicken joints. And that reminds me of the arthralgia that is caused in joints. So chick ung unya for chicken joints reminds me of the arthralgias. That's all of our category C agents, which concludes the video today. I hope that this was helpful to you. I know that it might seem like I went through this very quickly and a lot of these agents you've never heard of before, but if you remember how you tackled studying bacteria or viruses for the first time in general, before you knew what like Staph aureus was, the way that you learned it is you just hit that material over and over again and you memorize the nitty gritty details. If you want to be proficient with bioterrorism agents, that's really the only way to do it. And at the very least, if you understand these things, it'll make you sound really, really cool when you go home for family dinners and you tell everybody about the different ways that they can die.